What's up, Covalence friends? Today, we're gonna to be looking at server sent events, and we're gonna be using event source on the client to get that data. Let's get right into it. All right, so we're starting off with our Express template repo. If you don't have the link to this repo, it's in the description below. So go ahead and grab it, or just start with your own Express template. It's not a big deal. Uh, it's a pretty simple template. There's nothing complicated here. And basically, we have a API that uh, you know hooks into our primary um, router here, right? Uh, we're using JSON, we're parsing body parser, right, with JSON, and then we have our simple API that we're just into, and you know this has a v1, an API v1. So basically, our route is slash API slash v1 slash users, and then we have two pretty useless users routes here, right? So this post, uh, we're gonna get rid of it because that's garbage, um, but we're gonna change it to a git, and typically what we're gonna want is something like a stats route or something like that, right? So server sent events, best case, you know, best use cases for these are really like notifications or some sort of statistics or things that you need updated real time. So stock ticker, right? Stock ticker is like one of the prime examples of this. We want real time stock ticker values. It's constantly changing. And so if you need this constantly updated, right, we're going to send up a request that's gonna sit around and just wait for responses, right? So it's similar to WebSockets. You could use WebSockets for the same thing, but if you don't need bi-directional communication, if you don't need the client to talk to the server and constantly send up data, then there's no real need for a WebSocket, right? So we could use these server sent events. They can hook up directly to your existing HTTP server, so we don't need a separate WebSocket server to handle these and you should be good to go, right? So again, we're gonna create this slash stats route. Um, now, the funny thing is, is with, there are packages out there, I think there's like Express SSC, things like that that'll actually set all the headers and everything that you need, but we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna set our own headers because I like to manually do this and I feel like depending on where you're hosting your application, you may need some custom headers to actually make it work, right? You may need some custom headers to make these server send events work correctly. So we're gonna delete all this, this is nothing we need. Um, and then we're gonna actually create a new folder, we're gonna call it utils, and we are going to add a new file called index.ts, and we're gonna import our response from Express, because that's gonna be our argument that we're gonna be passing into our function. And then we're gonna export the function, let's just call it prep stream and we're gonna pass in our response. And then inside of this, we're going to set our headers. So we're going to res.set header, um, you know, uh, cache control. And the value is gonna be no cache because we do not wanna be caching this. And I guess we could just for um, redundancy sake, we can say if not res return, we don't wanna do anything. Uh, you know, just in case, you know, somebody passes in a prep stream or something that's undefined. We don't want to crash anything, so let's just double check that. Um, but res.set header, uh, we're going to send content type. Now we need a specific content type. If we do not set the correct content type, the event source will not work, right? So we actually need it to be text slash event stream. That's what it's expecting. And then we can actually signify the char set as well. So we're going to say UTF-8. Uh, I believe UTF-8 is default. Um, but just in case you're using a different kind of package that sets it to something else, or if you know, you're know you using something in the future that isn't by default charts at UTF-8 and you want to be UTF-8, it's better to always specify things rather than not, right? So let's go ahead and we're gonna keep setting headers. The next one is going to be the connection header, and this is going to be the value keep alive. Now, this value may not be mandatory, but for a lot of places that are hosting stuff, it is, so again, I would just make sure you put it there. And what we want to do is we want to make sure that the uh, server doesn't manually set or it doesn't manually kill your connection because realistically you want it to stay alive for as long as it needs to, right? So until the client itself closes the connection, you want this connection alive. So res.setheader. And the last one is going to be this X Excel buffering. And we're going to say no. Now, I believe this is the current requirement for Nginx to not buffer your responses. So if you're using Nginx and you're trying to send server sent events, it'll actually wait for the entire thing to be, the entire response to be sent and buffered before it sends it to the client. Now, 
a lot of the times this is used for compression purposes, right? So to compress a response, you actually need the whole response before you send it, right? So you cannot do this unless um, you basically can't, you, you need to, you, server side events will not work unless you don't have buffering. Sorry, kind of lost my train of thought there, but you need to make sure that nothing is being buffered. So we need to turn this off. Now this isn't everywhere. This only, I believe works in Nginx, but a lot of services use Nginx. So I put it in there just in case my code ends up running on Nginx, right? So you need to make sure that this, this header is not gonna hurt anything if it's there. So you might as well have it rather than not. But again, we need to make sure that service events are gonna work, right? Now, if you're using another service that doesn't use Nginx, you might need to set some other header, but look into what you need and make sure that you're good to go. Now, the last thing we're gonna do is we're going to flush these headers, which basically locks them in place. And then we're good. That's all the headers we really need. Um, the only thing I would suggest doing is I put a event listener for close, right? And now all we're going to really do here is we're going to um, res.end, which is going to end the response. And the issue with this is if we, if we actually call res.end and we close it on the server, it's going to propagate that to the client as an error. Um, I don't know exactly why. Uh, that's just how event sources work, right? And so when you close the when you close the response on the server, the event source will receive an error, and you realistically won't be able to tell if the event source received an error because the response was closed because it wanted to be closed, or if the response was closed because it didn't want to be closed because there was some sort of fatal error and your server went down. Now, event sources by default will retry the connection. And so if you just call res.end to close the response on the server, the client will continue trying to reconnect and you're either gonna get replication, redundancy, or you're gonna get some sort of behavior that you don't wanna happen, right? And so what you realistically have to do is wait until the client closes the connection, which is kind of a pain. So in a lot of cases, you wanna use server send events for cases where the client is the only one that should be closing this, like a stock ticker, right? But there are cases, you know, maybe like some dashboard instances where, or you may not, you may want the server to end up closing something. You may, there, the data might actually end at some point, right? And so, or if um, actually a stock ticker is a perfect use case scenario for this, because if, uh, if the client isn't checking the time, if you want to make sure that the server is the one checking the time, and the exchange closes, right? There's no more data changes. You don't wanna keep pushing data down to the client, right? You wanna close this somehow. And so we actually need to find a way to close it on the client, right? And so what we can do is first and foremost, we're going to obviously prep this stream. So we're gonna pass in the res. And then here's where we'd actually be grabbing our data and then kind of supplying it, but we're just gonna kind of use a, uh, well, let's first, let's create a counter um, we're going to use kind of a, just a demo demonstration. We're going to use a counter here and we're going to say set interval and we're going to do every two seconds just to kind of showcase, um, you know, so you actually see the delay. Uh, but we're going to counter plus plus first and foremost. So we're going to start at one. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to start writing to our event stream. And the way we do that is with res.write. And there is an actual standard for sending these events and it's event colon and then the event type. So message is pretty standard. Um, this is kind of the primary way to send a message. Uh, I believe the event that it's received is even called a message event. So message is really the one that is, it is expecting. And then we actually write our data so we'll write data colon, and then we could write, we could just put counter here, right? Um, and then that would be the data itself. We'd get this on the front end, and then we'd only have the data that we need. Uh, but you run into problems here, especially when you're doing things like text, right? So with something like a stock ticker, it should be fine. You'd have a value, but you might actually be sending down all of the values for a bunch of different stocks. And so obviously you don't, want just a big old string. You want it kind of uh, say structured somehow, right? And so just having it in this format, not always the best. Now, strings, if it was a message, for instance, um, also not a great idea because for instance, like ChatGPT is a great example. A lot of people using ChatGPT are using it to stream the content, right? And so 
when they stream it, a lot of times ChatGPT will return uh, content that has new lines at the end of it. And by default, this event source will remove those new line characters, right? And so you don't want those new lines removed. It'll remove it from the end of this string here. And so what you really need to do is you need to wrap this in an object and I'll use value for instance, you could use, you know, realistically, whatever you want here, I'm going to use value and then I'm going to wrap it in the object and then we're going to parse it on the front end. Right? And so we have our object. This solves everything. Even if you have, you know, string value here, it'll be encased in the new line characters. Obviously you want to make sure that you put some quotes around that if it is a string value, but again, you're kind of building your JSON. All right. And then the final thing that you do is you write two new line characters and that signifies the end of this message, right? Awesome. So that is going to be our value. We're sending that counter value. And then we're going to say, we're going to actually end the data on the server. So we're going to say if counter equals 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 five, we're going to clear the interval. And then what we're going to do is we're basically going to do the exact same thing except we're going to do a custom event. We're going to make close the custom event and we can change this because we obviously don't need that. So we're going to say date dot now we're gonna make it time and we can actually name this, name this, whatever we want, right? We could name this ping. Now ping is an important one. If, uh, if you haven't watched my WebSocket series, watch the WebSocket series, it's extremely good content and it actually gives you a lot of insight and valuable information on using server side events too, right? Because they're very similar. Um, the APIs are more or less, they work the same. Um, I have an authentication and authorization one that you should definitely watch because if you have to authenticate or authorize your server side events, uh, you're going to want to do it the exact same way as you do with WebSockets because you're not going to be posting data, right? So you can't set your headers when you do an event source. Um, so you actually have to do it. If you have to do it the exact same way that you would with a WebSocket. Now, if you're doing heartbeats, a lot of times what happens is the client or the server will lose connection. The connection will drop and then the other one will not know, right? So there's some sort of issue with the handshake there. And all of a sudden you just have these like ghost connections that aren't actually contributing or doing anything anymore. And they're just really just bogging down your server somehow. Right? And so what you want to be doing is you want to be constantly pinging and checking if the connection is still alive. And if it isn't, you want to manually close it, right? So you'd actually want to manually res dot end it on the server if the client stops responding to your ping. So again, you would do it very similarly with server send events. You can just constantly ping and then you will know if there's actually any type of, you know, response here. So again, um, the, uh, the way that you can ping this is you can actually create a ping here and you should be good to go. Now we don't have bi-directional communication here. So you'd have to, you know, more or less do it a different way where you're actually notifying the server that, um, you know, it does still exist, but more or less, uh, you know, you could actually end up closing it on the front end too. If you want, you could be sent doing the exact same ping process and, and manually closing it on the front end. So again, that is important, but we're going to show you how these custom events work here in a little bit. Um, but we're pretty much done with this. This should actually be supplying what we need to the front end. So let's go ahead and jump into our front end. We're going to go into our index.html and we're going to kind of change this up a little bit. So let's just change the title, call it SSC and let's remove this H1. Uh, but we're going to have a button um, with the ID stream and we're going to just call it request stream. And that's going to initiate our stream here. And then we're going to have our area where we're going to actually writing out our messages. So let's create a pre element and it's going to have the ID messages. It's all we really need for the HTML. We're going to keep it super simple. Um, I guess we could style this a little bit, right? So let's go ahead and have some styling on our messages. Let's give it some height and an overflow Y of auto and just a little margin top just to kind of push it away from the button a little bit. Um, but we're going to set a 25 M's. It's probably, it's definitely high enough for the count of five. Uh, but if we keep, you know, obviously running it, it'll continuously go. So maybe we'll just set it the high and we'll let it scroll. So again, we have our height set. That's all we really need for styles. It's not too important. You really don't even need to do that. If you don't want, you can skip that section. But what we, what is important is this section, right? 
So we need to actually grab our uh, button and our messages. So let's get our button in here and that's an HTML button element. And that's gonna be document.getElement by ID and that's going to be stream. And then we're gonna have messages, which is HTML element, document.getElement by ID and that's messages. And we can create a function. We can create a function called show message and that's going to take in a message of type string and basically we can check if not messages we can just return uh, and then we will do messages dot text content plus equals uh, let's do it's going to be a new line and then message right so oh well it's going to be a message the variable not just the text right there we go all right, and then we could say messages.scroll top equals messages.scroll height, and that should basically auto scroll um, just because we're you know adding to the bottom of the text content. So that should be good. And then we can say if not, you know, button uh, will console.log. This would be a developer error because the button isn't in the page. Um, let's just say, you know, you messed up. No button. Brownie face. And we'll just return. Otherwise, we want to add an event listener. And the event listener is going to be for a click. All right. And then when we actually add this event listener here, we're actually going to be setting up our event source. So we'll say const EVS equals new event source. And it's going to be our slash API forward slash V1 forward slash users forward slash stats, right? So that's the route that we set up. And we're going to evs.add event listener now, and we're going to listen for error, because it's good practice. And inside of our error, remember I said that if there is an error, it'll actually automatically retry the connection. So in here is more or less where you should be deciding whether or not you want to allow this to retry. If you don't want it to retry, you actually should close the connection. So um, for instance, like, let's just create this variable retry. Now that obviously isn't going to be how you write your code, but um, let's just pretend that this retry uh, is some sort of logic that you're getting from somewhere else. And so you would determine whether or not to retry. And if you do want to retry, you do nothing, right? So you actually just don't do anything in here. Else, you know, you say if not retry, if this is the logic that you determine, you don't want to retry, then you just evs.close. So in our case, we're always gonna close if there's an error. Um, but again, it would probably be something based on, you know, this error logic here, right? So checking out whether or not the error has any information that you need, or if it's just a particular case. Some people close it every time on error and they make, <coughs> excuse me, and they make some sort of other case be the, cause of a retry, right? So you could manually retry if you wanted to, you could just manually call this function again and create a new event source and continuously, you know, get the data that way. But by default, if you do not close this, it will retry the connection. So the next one that we want to do, um, we could, we have two more we need to do. We need to set up our message listener and then our custom message listener, which is our close event. So let's go ahead and add our custom event miss listener, uh, wow, custom event listener first, and that is the close event. Now, if we were listening, if we wanted this to be something other than close, if this was ping, right, if we called this ping, then this would actually be ping. So I really like how event sources handle this. I like how they handle the custom events. Um, you're literally just listening to the event uh, with whatever that you specify as the event, right? And so whatever type of event you wanna listen to on the front end, you can be listening for, which is really cool. Uh, so you could actually grab the data off of here, just like we're going to do with uh, um, our message as well, or you can not worry about it, right? So in our particular case, we're not going to really worry about it. We're just going to call evs.close. So, um, but if you wanted to like say, so we're going to also show message, let's just show message uh, connection closed, right? Now, if we wanted to show the message connection closed at a particular time, we could grab, we could parse this ev.data, or we could parse this event data, and we would actually show connection closed at that particular time, right? So 
Again, I don't wanna be formatting the date right now, but you guys can do that. Highly encourage it as an extracurricular activity. You know, use moment.js and just format that date and make it look really cool. All right, so we're just gonna move on to add event listener message. And this is where we're going to actually need to parse this. So we can actually just uh, grab the data itself. Um, and then we can create a function for actually parsing this too. So what we want to do is let's create, I'm going to create an asynchronous function. I'm going to call uh, async function uh, parse, right? And then this is going to actually take in data, which is a string. And we can say if not data, we're just going to return. Otherwise, we're going to try catch, you know, and we're going to console.log this error. If it happens, um, console.log, you know, error parsing data, right? Something like this. And in this try catch block, what we're going to do is we're actually going to JSON uh, const D equals JSON.parse data. And then we're going to show message d dot value, right? So d is basically it's an any value when you JSON dot parse, um, but we make sure that our object had a value in it, and that's what we're actually passing in, right? And so um, you could, if you wanted to, use this same function for your close. You could actually pass in a property here too, and you could say d of property, right? With the obviously the open braces and we could parse whatever value we want out of there, right? Um, and then that would actually show that message, but we're not gonna worry about that right now. Uh, we are going to make sure that we actually parse this data correctly. So we can just call parse ev.data and we should be good, right? So on every single message, we're going to parse it and we're gonna show the message. And if it fails, it the reason I did async function is just so that this try catch is a little bit more graceful and essentially is just a promise that, uh, you know, gracefully gets caught. So again, um, we have everything we need here. So I think we can go ahead and run this and see what I messed up. So we're going to open up a terminal. I've already NPM installed, obviously. So let's just NPM run dev. And it looks like we have zero errors. Surprise, surprise. And we're going to pop open a browser and we're going to go to localhost 3000. We're going to open up our Chrome dev tools here and we're going to request the stream and see what happens. So we have a request. That's good. That's a good start. We got a one. We got a two. We got a three. We got a four and we got a five and then the connection is closed. So it looks like it works. Uh, we can look at this request URL. Everything looks good. We get a 200. Okay. We have all of our response headers in here. It looks great. Um, and then we actually have this new tab in here called event stream. Now, if you've never worked with event sources before, you've probably never even seen this, which is you know interesting. Uh, but Chrome DevTools, beautiful thing. We have all of our events being sent at the time they're being sent. So actually, if we request another stream and we open this up, we can actually see this data coming in real time, which is super cool. So again, the browser tools are pretty awesome that Chrome comes out with. And they, uh, you know, are supporting these event streams and you get a really cool experience here, right? And so we have one, two, three, four, five connection closed. One, two, three, four, five connection closed. We request a stream twice. We have two requests and everything looks beautiful. Now, again, I want to just make sure you guys realize that we need to make sure that if you try and run this locally, a lot of times it works locally and then you deploy it somewhere and it just doesn't work anymore, which is really sad. It happens all the time though, and that's mostly, almost always because of buffering. And with Nginx, that X Excel buffering that we put in here should fix that. But with IIS, you have to add something to the web deck config. So make sure if you're deployed on Azure, you, you have to understand you know, how to fix that. Um, if you're using something like Cloudflare, a lot of the times you need to do stuff with caching and, so, and, and things like that. So you need to make sure that wherever it's deployed, you understand how to make that work. Now, just like where you're hosting it, sometimes it could be the NPM package. So if we actually, um, there's a really common NPM package called compression, which I believe gzips all of your responses. It compresses all your responses, which is good to have. I mean, almost, I, ha I have this in almost every single one of 
Uh, my projects, I use, so you want to compress the responses. You want to make them as small as possible. And so a lot of times people will install this compression package and I installed compression and at types compression, right? So I wanted the compression types. And then in our primary router configuration here, um, we can import compression from compression. And then typically, you know, it'd go kind of like right here where you would essentially compress the response or you're, you're adding it in as middleware and you're gonna be compressing all your responses. But that one line of code, if we now run our, uh, our server again, and we go back to our client. All right, we can refresh just to kind of show this for sure. We can request a stream and we got a 200 okay, but nothing's happening. You know, the event stream running, but we're not getting any data. And all of a sudden you're just like, what the heck happened? I don't understand. All I did was add compression. Well, that's because you cannot compress responses without the entire response, right? And so we're gonna go ahead and end that um, and the way that you fix this is we have to go into our user.ts here and the compression package actually adds a function to your response in Express called flush. And so right here, we are going to, uh, we actually want to res.flush after each amount of data. So we're going to flush it here, right? So right after here, we wanna flush the buffer. And then right after here, we wanna flush this buffer as well, right? And so basically after each message, we are going to flush it to the client and this should allow us to actually get the data again. So fingers crossed, we have our server running. We're going to call and boom, we got one, we got two, we got three. We got four and we got five, connection closed. All right, so that happens almost simultaneously. Um, you could actually wait to flush it until after. So you could flush it here, right? You could flush everything after, but it will flush all of that essentially at the same time. Um, you still will get the, you know, the right value and whatnot, so it doesn't really matter. But again, this is what you need to do. You need to make sure you're flushing and you should have, you should be successful with your service and events. All right, so I hope you guys enjoyed that and I hope it was easy enough to understand. Uh, if you guys have any additional questions, feel free to drop them in the comments below. I know I got a little wordy at times, but I tried to keep it quick. Make sure you subscribe, check out our courses if you want to learn how to code you know, better or just at all and check out our merch store as well. The link is in the description below. Feel free to drop us a line. We love hearing from you guys and we love your feedback. Until next time, Get out of here.